So here's, here's what I'd say about um, going door to door. Um, the short answer is any method of evangelism that you believe that God wants you to do, then do it. Okay? Um, and don't let anyone say you shouldn't do that. Because if God's telling you to do something, then just do it. Right? Um, I have had periods in my life where I did a lot of going door to door. Um, here we haven't specifically gone door to door. Specifically, we've, we've definitely gone door to door, put literature in people's doors and things like that. We haven't specifically knocked on doors for the purpose of sharing the gospel. The main reason we haven't done that here is because we were told that's not culturally sensitive and people might get annoyed. But at the same time, uh, so how else are they going to hear about the gospel? Is my question. How, and if I'm a Christian, I'm living in my town, how can I be sure that everyone in my estate knows, has at least had the opportunity to hear the gospel if I'm not going and talking to them? So I personally am like, go for it. You know what I mean? Like, yeah, go out, talk to people, knock on doors. If they don't like it, I did in America, guess what? They didn't always like us in America either. It, it's okay, you know. Um, you're just asking a question, you know. So there, there's different ways you can go about doing it. But I think just frank and honest, hi, you know. My name's William. I go to Malibu Bible Fellowship. And I was just wondering if uh, you mind if I ask you a couple questions or, you know, anything like that. And then if they say no, say no problem. You usually always have something in your hand. So you can say, hey, well, here's some information about our church in case you're ever interested. Thank you for your time. And move on. Um, if they do want to talk, then great. And then... Like we said, with this whole, the ask, admire, admit stuff, you know, let me ask you, in your experience, what does it take for a person to go to heaven? You know, something like that. And then that will give you an idea and a window. Uh, we used to do one where we would have established, so people would visit our church or different things like that. And so we would kind of, my dad, who was the pastor at the time, would call these different people and say, hey, listen, on uh, Tuesday night, you know, would you mind if we had a couple of people from our church stop by, answer any questions you may have? And so we would line, we would line those up, um, and then every Tuesday night, we would have groups go out in twos and threes, and they'd make these scheduled visits to these different places. But then if you went to those scheduled visits and that person wasn't home or something, if you had a few minutes, then you'd go and uh, maybe go down that street and you just knock on each door. And when they'd answer, we'd say, hey, listen, we're from our church at the time. Uh, we're doing a quick survey, wondering if you'd be willing to answer a few questions. As our survey was just, you know, would you consider yourself to be a religious person? You know, we had like just five questions. But the last question was, in your understanding, what does it take for a person to go to heaven? That was the question that we would ask for a chance that maybe that would lead us into having a gospel conversation. So then they would share if they had an opinion, and if so, what it was, and say, would you like for us to show you from the Bible how you can know for sure you're going to heaven? And then... If they said, yeah, sure, then we talked to them. If they said, no, thank you, all right, bye. So I don't think there's any problem with it. Uh, I do think it's valuable to go with someone else, not to go on your own, uh, especially when you're first getting started. If you can go with someone who has done it before, then you can kind of get an idea of what's involved, how to handle people who are just really angry or different situations like that, um, or how to handle conversations going well, you know, and you want to continue that on, how to answer questions. So... Um, and then it's, you always have, you know, the strength in numbers, you know, and it's just nice to have another person with you. Um, if any, you know, yeah, Bible Baptist and Balancholic, they do it. And yeah. <clears throat> oh no, you can contact me. You and I can go. We'll be great. Uh, that's, it's actually a desire of mine is to, again, I've been here now eight years, eight years. I've been, I've been here eight years. Uh, in that time frame, we've shared the gospel with a lot of people. We've done events. We've shared the gospel with thousands of people or at least put it into their hands in the form of a track or something like that. But at the end of the day, it always comes back. How do I know that every person in my town has heard the gospel or at least had the opportunity to? Have, have we as a church gone to all those houses? Have we put literature in their door? Have we spoken with someone at those doors? If the answer is no, is that something we should do? And uh, I'm at the point right now where I'm like, you know, just go for it. <laughs> you know, that's part of the reason why um, we're doing the Mallow Garden Festival. Is hey, let's let's. We've always done booths at festivals. We've always handed out tracks at festivals. 
but we've always kind of taken a, we've tried not to be too what other people would consider to be pushy by actually saying, no, this is a tent for evangelism. Our desire is to share the gospel at this tent. That's the goal. Not to let them know about our church, not to let them know that there's a church like us out there, but strictly we want to share the gospel with people. And so that's our goal for this event is this is evangelism. We are going to be asking people if they know these things about God and lead that into a gospel conversation. Which is... <clears throat> yeah. Yeah. It's, it's something that... Um, it is, you just have to start doing it. Um, it. It will never get any easier. Now, I say that, it, it'll certainly be, you'll develop, you develop a fairly thick skin pretty quickly as far as just going and talking to people um, because you're just, you get used to it. Uh, but it's that initial, if you haven't done it in a while or you've never done it before, walking up to a complete stranger and saying, hey, my name is John. I was wondering if you'd like to talk about Jesus. That's a pretty intimidating thing for you to do. And so going back to what we talked about last week, if I know that there's a house on fire, I get way less hesitant about whether I should knock on the door first or if I should just break it down and try to pull people out of it, right? I get a lot more bold when the danger is right there in front of me and I can see it. And I'm not really aware. If someone's like, you broke my window. Yeah, and I saved someone's life. You know what I mean? Like, so to me, that the risk is worth it. Where, you know, just like uh, most, most police officers, you know, if, if police officer has, what's it called? Um, it's some kind of immunity. I can't, qualified immunity or something. But where if they have to, if they're serving a search warrant and they have to come in and break a door down, they, if they're serving a legal search warrant or whatever, and that person didn't come and answer the door, they're not going to pay for that door, right? <laughs> because they had authority to come in and do that. We as believers... God has given us the authority as if we were Christ himself to go and talk to people. And so it's not, so when people say things like, well, you shouldn't be pushing your religion on others. Well, unfortunately for you, the Bible says, not only should I, but I must. That's, that's part of my duty. I would, not, I would not be loving you if I did not tell you this. Because if I genuinely believe that your soul is in danger of hell and I don't come and tell you, then that's not very loving of me. So what I'm doing right now is actually a very loving thing to do. <clears throat> right? And so having that, recognizing that we have that authority, that we have the commission, the call to go, that is what emboldens us to go. And then the, the human fear of, well, what are they going to think of me? Or what if I don't know what to say or whatever? That stuff kind of doesn't matter anymore. Because it still comes to, well, I have to. Firefighters are nervous to go into burning buildings. They don't say, ah, oh, that fire's no big deal. Not if they're smart. Like, and they have safeguards and protections to help them. But they still go into the building because it's worth it. You know? And they're not just going to, well, sorry, it's too risky. There was a um, case several years ago where there was a school shooting in the States. And um, the police officers who arrived on scene, even though they just had training a month before, of what to do when, you were, when you're the first responder to a, a shooting, they did not go inside and they kept anyone else from going inside as there's an active shooter going through the school. There were parents who were trying to go and help and the police officers were stopping them from going in. And they said, we're waiting for backup. Yeah, and so finally, some, a couple of parents just said, yeah, we're gonna do it anyway. You know, one of them went and broke a window open and was pulling people out. They're like, our kids are in there, you know, because everyone, you know, and another guy went and actually went and stopped the shooter himself, you know. <clears throat> Let's go, you know, like who cares? And so, but the, the thing is, those police officer, officers had the authority and the training to go and do it, but they allowed their fear to keep them from doing that, right? And they And they kept from saving people's lives, saving children's lives because... They were like, what if I get shot? Or what if I get in trouble? You know? And so, so at the end of the day, we have to weigh the call, the cost, if we don't go. You know? There's an urgency to it. And so, um, say that again? Yeah. Yeah, and that'll happen. 
you know, and, and the thing you're always going to encounter people. You're always going to encounter people who are rude. But okay, at the end of the day, you, our duty is to present everybody with the gospel to to attempt to, to to try to share the gospel with everyone that we meet if we can. And so that's our goal. And so because Christ has given us that commission to do that, then we do it. And honestly, who cares what happens to us? Look at every single person who did that in Scripture. They were universally rounded up and killed. All of them. So if I'm not getting killed right now, sweet, I'm ahead of the game. And if I am getting thrown into prison, great, now I'm with everybody else who ever did this. And so that's kind of the, you know, mentality. I've never been threatened with arrest. I've been threatened to get off property before. You know, you know, and I chose to leave the property even though technically, legally, I didn't have to. Um, you know, but, yeah. So it was, uh, that, huh? No, 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 it was, it was public property. <clears throat> it was on public, it was in an estate here, River Valley. We had a few people who didn't want us there. And uh, we said, well, we have five church members who live here who have invited us to come and do a Bible club here. And so we're going to do it. And they said, we'll call the guards. So we went to the guards and we talked with the guards. The guards said, there's no law that says you can't do that. You know, we went to the county council. The county council was like, pretend you were never here. Just go do what you want. And so we were like, great. We had insurance. We did the, when we went to set up the next week, they knew we were coming and they got angry and they came out. They called the guards. The guards came out. We had this whole hour long deal. And at the end of it, it was really our choice. So you can stay if you want. And uh, so we prayed and asked the Lord what we want us to do, and we felt, no, nope, we're not going to stay here if we're not wanted. So we went and did it somewhere else, and they had a great time. Shared the gospel. So, uh, that, that would be true. I'd say that's true. And I would, th- I, I would, I would say that each, every, um, every pastor has, has a lot of weight on them to make responsible choices that are good for their church. And, and I also think that pastors can agree to disagree on things. You know? And perhaps it wasn't the right time for that. Make sense? Um, all right, we need to jump in. So what I want to do tonight is, again, it's, it's so crucial. Like, if you can build a bridge of trust with people by asking first what they believe and allowing them to talk about it, First of all, there, there's, there's another reason I didn't really touch on last week is sometimes you get into the trouble of assuming what they believe instead of letting them tell you. And then you start going down these trails, these avenues of, well, I can contradict that with this, or I can do this, when that might not even be what, what they're held up about. And so it's very important to actually ask questions and find out. So when someone says, well, how does science and the Bible agree? Like in my brain, I'm like, okay, well, there's this, 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 and this. But before I'm just going to run down any of those routes, like, well, when you say that, what do you mean? What, what's the biggest hang-up that you have? I had a conversation today where someone said that exact thing. And I said, what do you mean? What would you say is, Josiah, please don't play with that. What, what would you say is the, uh, the, the biggest argument you have? Where does, the, where does the Bible and science not seem to agree? And so then they told me. I said, okay, great. Let's talk about that. Right? If you don't ask questions, sometimes you jump into it. Even if someone says, I'm Catholic, ask them, well, what is, to you, what does that mean? Or, as a Catholic, what do you understand it takes for a person to go to heaven? Right? And I've asked plenty of people in Bible-believing churches, what do you believe it takes for a person to go to heaven? I don't know. They couldn't even articulate it. Right? So, you know, I could have just been like, well, good, man. I'm glad you're going to this church. Therefore, you must be saved. And they may have no clue what the gospel says. Or no one's actually sat down and ever talked with them about it and asked, answered their questions. So asking them what they believe is, is very essential. And it helps build trust. Uh, so we're not going to recover everything we covered last week. We are going to move on. But I encourage you, I just, and I apologize, I just sent out the link today to that website. But I encourage you to go and look. Um, and it has it. Let's go on. Josiah, go ahead and go to the video, bud. Next, you'll want to share the gospel, which is a lot like following a flight plan. One way to tell the gospel clearly is to include six main points that tell the whole story of redemption that God laid out in the Bible. You can remember these by spelling out the word gospel. 
first, the G. God created us to be with Him. In Genesis 1 and 2, we see that God made Adam and Eve to be in a relationship with Him. Adam and Eve represent all of humanity, including you and me. That means God created us to be with Him. O is, our sins separate us from God. We see this in Genesis 3, when Adam and Eve chose their own way over God's, and their sin corrupted all of humanity. They were headed toward hell, and so is everyone else who has ever sinned. The S stands for, sins cannot be removed by good deeds. Basically, we're all sinners. We'll never be good enough on our own to make it to heaven. But then there's P, paying the price for sin. Jesus died and rose again. Jesus died in our place for our sin. When Jesus said, it is finished, the price of your sin and mine was paid in full. And now, E, everyone who trusts in him alone has eternal life. We see this in the book of John. When we put our faith in Jesus alone to forgive us for all our sins, we're saved forever. And finally, L, life with Jesus starts now and lasts forever. When we trust in Christ, God's Holy Spirit comes to live in us and we start a personal, permanent relationship with God. Just as a pilot trains in a flight simulator, you should practice saying the G-O-S-P-E-L until it's fully memorized. Then you know how to pilot a conversation at any time. So we'll turn that off. So we're going to go through that. I know that was really fast, but we're actually going to go through it. So just, I, just pay attention and start clicking with me. So let's, let's look at this plan in a little more detail. And then afterwards, I believe upstairs I have this actually printed out in a booklet form that you can take home with you. Josiah, go ahead. All right, keep going. <clears throat> All right. Uh, this actually will reemphasize what we were just talking about. But Acts 26 says, I am sending you to them to open their eyes and turn them from darkness to light. Something we need to understand when we're sharing the gospel is the Bible says that Satan, the god of this world, has literally blinded the hearts, the spiritual eyes of people so that they cannot understand the gospel. I think it's vital that when you go, whether that's I'm going to go knock on doors or, oh, I've set up this meeting, I'm going to go talk to somebody, or you just glance at someone you're like, I'm going to go talk to them about Jesus right now, that as you go, you pray and you say, God, let this be a, a window of opportunity where this person can see clearly the gospel and help me to understand it or help me to speak so they can understand it. Because recognizing that the powers of the darkness of the, this world are blinding the eyes of others, it is imperative that we go in prayer, not only asking the Holy Spirit to give us utterance, but also to open the eyes and the ears of those who need to hear the gospel. Otherwise, those words are just going to bounce off. So pray and ask God, literally right there, God, bind the hands of Satan right now. Lord, uh, take the blinders off of their eyes. Take the mud out of their ears so that they can hear the gospel, that they can have a chance to hear the gospel clearly and be able to respond to it of their own accord. Does that make sense? It, it's, I'm telling you, a huge difference. Because we're not salespeople. We're not going and trying to sell people Jesus. You know, and, and the wonderful thing is, um, God is already working on the hearts of people who need to hear the gospel. You don't know who those people are. And so as you're sharing the gospel, there are going to be some who are already going to be ready to respond to the gospel. Because God is the one who's been doing a work in their hearts. And you don't know how long it's been going on. It could be years that that's been going on. And you just get to have the privilege of introducing them to the gospel. And so it's vital that you pray that God would help you. And again, I, I said it before, your, your own heart, you know, you may realize that there's some sin that you need to deal with. And while you're thinking about that, God says, hey, you see that person over there? I want you to go talk to them. And instantly you bet, God, I'm not ready. Like, God, we're not even right right now. Don't listen. If God says, go talk to him, go talk to him. Right? Because it's not about you. It's not about how spiritual you are. It's not about how good you are. You are someone who was lost and has been found. And you just want to tell other people who the shepherd is. That's your job. Just so I go ahead and... Yeah. 
Yeah, six years. Six years later. And we like to say this. Usually, on average, now I don't know who came up with this, but on average, someone says, someone said this, it takes someone 12 touches with the gospel before they're ready to, before they understand it, they're ready to make a decision, okay? Uh, Paul, the Apostle Paul in the Bible, he said it this way, he said, Josiah, what are you doing? Please just leave it on that and leave it alone. Uh, the Apostle Paul said, I planted, Apollos watered, but God gave the increase. And what he was talking about there was uh, how different believers can have an impact on one soul, but ultimately God's the one who brings forth the result. He said, hey, I might have planted the seed. Someone else might have came and put some water in it. Someone else might have came and weeded the garden. God's the one who produces the fruit. Right? And so you don't know if you're the twelfth touch or the first touch. You're just going to go and try to introduce them to the gospel. And if all you get is, no, I don't want to talk about that, hey, they just got their first touch. Great. You know? That's all you got to do. All right, Josiah. So this one says, so this is the G. Um, <clears throat> if you have time, it's one I love to tell the story of the gospel. And that's what this is set up to do, to actually describe the story of the gospel. This is all the way from Genesis to Revelation. Uh, you don't have to use every verse from Genesis to Revelation, but this is the story of the gospel. And so why did, why did God put a story about Adam and Eve at the beginning? Some people think that's not even that important. They think that's just allegory. That's just a story. It's not even real. No, it's history. And if you don't understand Genesis 1, 2, and 3, then the gospel doesn't make sense. But because Adam was your literal physical ancestor, it matters very much what happened in Genesis 1, 2, and 3. And so that's where we take people because this is the story of the gospel. You don't need Jesus if Adam didn't sin. And so that's why we go back there. So the, the G in gospel is God created us to be with him. That's Genesis 1, Genesis 2. Just I go to the next verse. <clears throat> Psalm 100 verse 3 says, Know that the Lord is God... It is he who made us, and we are his. We are his people and the sheep of his pasture. This is why God created us. God created us to have intimate connection and fellowship with him. In Genesis, it describes this relationship that God had with Adam and with Eve. It says that every evening, God would come, and he would walk in the garden with Adam and Eve. And they would communicate together. And they would spend time together. Now picture that. The person who spoke the star. We just had the solar eclipse the other day. That's a whole other subject of the amazing uh, intelligent design that went into it. That the moon is just the right size to where when it passes in front of the sun, it completely covers the entire sun. But in such a perfect circle, in such a perfect way that there's actually this corona effect that's all around. It's amazing. It's incredible. The fact that the sun just so happens to be 93 billion miles away and the, the moon just so happens to be 250,000 miles away. So it lines up just perfectly so that we can witness this miracle every once in a while. And people throughout all centuries have seen this miracle happen. That God... The one who did that, just so that we'd know who he is, wants to have an intimate connection with his creation. And he desires to know you, and he desires for you to know him personally. God is a personal God, and God created us to be with him and to enjoy him. Next slide, Josiah. It did not. Our sin separates us from God. Our sin separates us from God. So that's the next one. Josiah, next one, please. Romans 3.23, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. You've highlighted that one, okay? So you can, you can use Genesis for a lot of this, by the way, okay? In Genesis chapter 3, Adam and Eve sin against God, and death passes upon all mankind. What that means is that when Adam sinned, because he is your ancestor, he brought the curse of sin and death upon his children. And their children brought it to their children. Their children brought it to their children. So on and so forth, all the way to you. So when you were born, you were born a sinner. It's not that you were born and started doing a bunch of terrible things. You were born in sin. And so your sin separates you from God. God is a holy God. The verse here in Romans 3 says, we fall short of his glory. God is not going to have communion and intimate connection and fellowship with a being that is not holy. 
He cannot. It is against his very character and nature. And so all of a sudden you see Adam and Eve have come to this place now to where they have sinned against God. And because of that, God had already told them what the consequence would be. This consequence was not a, just a punishment. This was the natural consequence of bringing sin into a holy relationship. Is that the one who is holy can no longer have fellowship with the sinners. Because they're unholy now. Well, God did not want us to stay that way. That was not the point of creation. The point of creation was so that God could be with us forever and have fellowship with us and have intimate connection. But he knew now that, now that mankind has sinned, mankind is unable to get back to being that holy thing that they were before. Just I go to the next one. Sins cannot be removed by good deeds. Go ahead to the next one. So we can see the verse. Isaiah 64, 6. All of us have become like one who is unclean, and all our righteous acts are like filthy rags. We all shrivel up like a leaf, and like the wind, our sins sweep us away. Isaiah said this. This is God speaking through Isaiah. He said, our sin, all of our righteousness, all the best we have to offer, think about all the good things you've done in your life. Think about all the wonderful things, the times that you've cared, you've had compassion on others, you've given money out of your own pocket for others, you've tried to help the poor, you've tried to, feel like, those are the, we love those people, right? And we lift them up. But even the very best that we can do, the Bible says it's like filthy rags. It, it doesn't matter. It's not that that wasn't a good thing to do. But in the scope of the holiness of God, it's like nothing. There is nothing we can do to be good enough for God to accept us. That verse in Romans says we, we fall short. Some may shoot their arrow, <laughs> and they may get closer, but no one's going to make it. You might as well shoot an arrow at the moon. You can all aim at it, and we can all try our best to be good people and to live good lives. But I'm telling you from personal experience, I've tried, and sometimes I can try for a while, and then I fail again. And beyond that, it's not just the doing, it's the being. I am a sinner. It, it, would, it would be like trying to change the color of my skin. I was born this way. I cannot change how I was born. There's nothing that I could ever do to make me not a sinner. It's, it's just part of who I am. It's part of who everybody is who's ever been born. Not only that, but I sin. The Bible has this really fancy word. It says it's an iniquity. It's willful sinning against God. And so both because I'm a sinner and because I sin, I am unholy. And so there's no way that I can, even the best I have to offer is not good enough. Next one, Josiah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, and the thing is, the very best you can give still isn't good enough. Like, it, it, even, even Christians and believers have this idea of what good is, and if they're not careful, they'll just kind of go off what that idea is. That's not holiness. That's your idea of what holiness is. God's idea of holiness and yours and mine are two different things. So I always feel like a really good person when I'm doing things my way. But when I begin to yield my life to God, right, and people say, God, is there something in my life that doesn't please you? Oh, yeah, there is. And he's like, well, what about the, the way you spoke to your wife last week? I'm like, oh, yeah. I mean, I guess that's true. And then he begins revealing things that I honestly didn't even consider to be a problem. But what about this? Wait, that's a problem? Yeah. Oh, shoot. And then you begin to see just how unholy you actually are. Like Isaiah, Pastor Doug preached about it the other week. When Isaiah, the prophet of God, sees God, he goes, woe is me. I'm unclean. Yes, sir. When I tell you to go to the next one, you go to the next one. Does that make sense? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's not a balancing. There's no balance. Your good does not outweigh your bad. You, it doesn't work that way. No, it's just bad and you're done. No matter how much good you do, you're never going to be able to lift that scale. Yeah. 
So the next one, paying the price for sin, Jesus died and rose again. So here's the beautiful thing. God, knowing that I could not save myself, knowing that I could not be good enough for heaven, said, I'll do it for you. And he sent his son, Jesus, to be born as a human being who never sinned. And when he was born, the Bible says he was born of a virgin, the Virgin Mary, which we absolutely believe in. That's always a good thing to throw in with Catholics. Yeah, we believe that too. The virgin, he had to be born. He had to be born of a virgin because he had to be born without the curse of man upon him. Does that make sense? Did you ever wonder why did Jesus have to be born of a virgin? It's because Adam was the one who brought death and death passes from father to child. So for a woman to have a child without a man, but instead the holy God, now you've bypassed the curse of sin, which is passed from father to child. So now even though his mother's not perfect, even though she's a sinner, it doesn't matter because the curse doesn't come from the woman, it comes from the man. That's, it, it was Adam. Yeah. So because of Adam's sin, we're all sinners. So, the Bible calls Jesus the second Adam. So, because Jesus came and was born without sin and lived a life without sin and died and rose again from the, from the dead, he and he alone had the power. started it so one man's payment can finish it but it had to be a perfect man one of the children paid for the sin of the father pretty cool so just I go to the verse and never wondered why yeah it wasn't like literally I was in Bible college and I was like oh like I never thought about why she needed to be a virgin but there you go Romans 5, it says, but God demonstrates his own love for us and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. So here's, if you want to know if God loves you, look at Jesus. He sent his only son to die for us. <clears throat> so while, notice, while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Not once we did enough good things, Christ made the payment for the rest of it, but rather when we were still sinners, the Bible even says when we were the enemies of God. Jesus died for us. Okay? Just I go to the next one. Everyone who trusts in him alone has eternal life. Go to the next verse, or to the verse, please. John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. That word whosoever, or whoever in this particular version, whosoever means anyone can be saved. It doesn't mean everyone will be saved. But the, Jesus shed his blood for everyone. And it says, what do they have to do? Whoever believes in the Son. God loved the world. He gave his only Son. Whoever believes in the Son has eternal life. It's as simple as that. And so, when we come to God, we don't come to him with our good works and say, look at all the good things I've done. You should accept me. No, that's not legal tender. <laughs> When you come to God, you say, I'm not coming to you on anything I've done. I'm a sinner. But Jesus died for me. He paid my debt. I'm coming to you on the authority of the name of Jesus Christ. That's it. And that's where all, every, <laughs> every time you see a twist in Christianity, it's Jesus plus something else. Jesus plus baptism, Jesus plus good works, Jesus plus the church, Jesus plus this, Jesus plus that. No, it's Jesus plus nothing. And we firmly believe, and we attest to this, if you come to God with Jesus plus something, then you have not come to God yet. John 14, 6, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but by me alone. That's it. Right? And so when I speak, especially with Catholics... I say the problem is, yes, you believe in Jesus, 
but you believe in Jesus plus stuff. And when you come to Christ, it has to be Jesus alone. Here's the beauty of that. Just so I go to the next one. Life with Jesus starts now and lasts forever. The beauty is that when I come on the basis of Jesus Christ alone, I, I inherit right then eternal life that starts now and lasts forever. You cannot lose your salvation because then it's not eternal. Plain and simple. You can not have it, but once you have it, you cannot lose it because it's eternal. End of story. Go to the verse, Josiah. John 17, 3 says, Now this is eternal life, that they know you, the only true God and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. This is life eternal. You know the only true God and Jesus Christ. So, eternal life, by definition, never ends. What God has granted you in this present life will not be removed from you in the next life if you don't measure up in this life. You're saved now forever. Okay? Now, we talked two weeks ago about the fact that when you come to Christ, you come to Him as Lord and Savior. He cannot be your Savior without also being your Lord. So when we come to Him, we submit to Him. And so when you share the gospel with people, you need to make sure they understand. This is not just, hey, pray this prayer real quick, and then you're good. You're, you know? It's, yeah, the, the prayer is a result of the belief. And when you come to God, you have to believe that He is a rewarder of those who seek Him. That's what Hebrews chapter 11 says. We come to God recognizing that we do not have the answers. Only He does until we are seeking Him. We are seeking salvation from Him. And by doing that, we are declaring that He is the authority in our life, not ourselves. Based upon that belief, when you pray, you'll be saved. All right. Um, so that's that. I'm going to pause for a brief second. Uh, does anyone have any questions? Again, I, I said I'm pretty sure I have some booklets upstairs that have this whole thing spelled out in actually even greater detail. And I'll hand those to you afterwards, and then you can hang on to them. You can study them. Uh, and then if you're, you can sit down with people and go through them. Uh, in just a minute, I'll show you some apps and stuff you can use on your phone as well that have all this laid out in there as well. So but does anyone have any questions about that gospel presentation? Okay. So now we've done two. We've done the Romans Road, and we've done the gospel method. I know, buddy. There's several more slides. We're not finished yet. Does that make sense? So, so both of the... Keep going, buddy. Go ahead, buddy. Yes, there it is. Thank you. Go ahead. That's the last one in there completely. I know. Go to the next one, please. Yes, thank you. We're doing two lessons. Um, uh, so I want to I encourage you. These are ways that you can share the gospel. One way is not better than the other way. And there's many more ways. You'll be learning more later. There's other ways to share the gospel as well. These are just some good ways to do it, and it gives you a framework. Uh, I would highly encourage you, as you're sharing the gospel, to be talking about yourself throughout. And what I mean by that is when you, when, when you say, our sin separated us from God, you think, yeah, I'm a sinner, right? You need to own that. Now, there's a thing in Scripture that says we shouldn't glorify sin, and I think what it means by that, I could be wrong, but what it means is, you don't have to sit there and rehash every single sin you did in your life when sharing the gospel with somebody. Man, I was a terrible... You know what happens a lot of times? Is you end up... Some people might end up actually having so much fun sharing about all the stuff that they used to do that it's questionable. was like, do you miss that stuff? Like, what's going on here? You know what I mean? Like, and so it, you, can, you can end up running into that of, yeah, we used to do this and this, and then you'll run off and start telling all these stories about all these things you used to do and kind of forget the whole point of why you're here, you know? And so it's, it's good to share where you were before Christ, but don't leave it at that and don't stay there and don't glorify it and don't make it sound any Because we all know that was a terrible place to be. That was not good. Um, you can easily romanticize it, Right? Like, oh, we had good times, you know, like, well, then what you, what'd you get saved from, you know? So, um, <clears throat> so anyways, so, but, but it's important to share, you know? And when you get to the part about, man, when I realized that Jesus Christ paid, paid for my sins, I was like, whew, that's good, because I thought I was just done, you know? When I heard that 
and, and share, don't, don't make things up, but share what happened in your life uh, because your story is the most powerful part that you can have in sharing the gospel. And I think I told you, practice that. Write it, write it down if you have to. Write down your testimony. We're not going to do it in this lesson. Let's move forward. Just I go to the next one. Oh, should probably unmute this. The conversation well. First ask if what you've said makes sense and answer any questions they may have. Then ask, is there anything holding you back from trusting in Jesus right now? Give them the opportunity right then to put their faith in Jesus. Once they trust Christ, do what you can to help them grow spiritually and get connected with a good church congregation. You can also help them learn to navigate their own gospel conversations. Have them go to their app store and download the Life in Six Words app. It has built-in questions you can both use to get passengers on board, fly smoothly, and land safely, so you can share the gospel with anyone at any time, fulfilling Jesus' command to go and make disciples. What friend can you share the gospel with today? All right. So, to, I've said this whole time. This is not a sales pitch. That's not what we're doing. But that being said, there's a term, there's a, there's a phrase in, in salesmanship, right? Um, it's ABC, always be closing. Have you heard that one before? Always be closing. Okay, clo closing a sale means you actually have them sign something, right? Like you actually finalize it, you actually take the money, you actually get the signature. It, like you can be a great salesman, but if you don't know how to close it, right? Well, great. You hyped me up on this product and I'd like to buy it, but you didn't give me an, op an opportunity to do that. Pastors are famous for doing this. They'll preach this amazing sermon about sharing the gospel, and then they'll preach the gospel, and people are moved, and people want to do something. They say, all right, let's pray. And they pray, and everyone goes home. It's like, man, if God's moving, you see people, then, then give them an opportunity right then to do something about it. Like, God's working now. So let's let them work. And a lot of times, you might share the gospel, and you might have people, you've walked through, man, if they're listening to you the whole way through, then they're interested. And so how do I actually get from, first, I asked if they wanted to hear the gospel, and for some reason they said yes, right? Because God must be working in their heart. And then they let me tell them the entire gospel, and they, and they seemed interested, and I was able to answer questions and things on, share all kinds of stuff. Now what? Now we've got to land the plane, Right? We got to end it. We need to ask them. Would you like to do this? So let's look at this. Josiah, go ahead and go to the next one. <clears throat> so after you finish, you heard this in the video. It says, does this make sense? Does what I said make sense? Is there anything you have questions about? And answer their questions. Okay? Like, make sure that they know what you just told them. Oftentimes when I share the gospel, I end up sharing it three or four times. If I have someone who says, I'd like to know how to get to heaven, then I sit down with them and I share the gospel with them and then I share it with them again. Right? And I ask them, does that make sense? Does it make sense? If it doesn't make sense, great. Let's talk about it. Okay? Answer their questions and help them. So literally, when you finish saying, all right, let me show you. L, you know, um, life with Jesus begins now and lasts forever and you share all that, then say, does this make sense? And let them respond. Give them a chance to come back to you with something. And then you can help. You can see where they're at. You can see if they understood it. If it just all went over their head, but they were just being polite. You know, like you can help them with that. Um, <clears throat> William. I don't know if I want to put you on the spot or not. See, here's the thing about William you guys might not know is William and I talk, like William got saved, me and William talked, and he got saved. Um, and I, I vividly remember it. As far as my, if my memory is correct, this is the conversation. We had been at camp, it was a Thursday, and the Lord was just dealing with all kinds of teenagers, and everyone's just talking about the gospel and things like that. And I pulled William outside, and I said, William, you know, I, man, I can't remember the first question I asked you. Do you remember? Yeah. I think it was something along the lines of, have you ever done this? Have you ever, you know, do you believe this? Is this? Have you ever put your faith in Jesus or something like that? And he said, no. And I said, why not? Do you remember what you said? He said, 
No one's ever asked me. Just like that. And I said, well, I'm asking you right now. Do you want to know how you can go to heaven? And it wasn't that William hadn't heard the gospel. But no one had told him, hey, let's do this. You know? Like, let's just make this final. And so, and so that's what we did. And so, again, I didn't just say, okay, pray with me right now. I said, well, let's, look, let's open the Bible and look at what it says to make sure that you understand. And we walked through. He's like, yeah, I understand all that. I said, okay, do you want to pray? He said, yeah. And so he prayed right there. Because it wasn't that he wasn't interested. It wasn't that he hadn't been thinking about it or whatever. And he had been going along with everything. But there had just never been that finality of, I'm going to make this decision. And so he just said, no one's ever asked me. And I was like, dang. Like, he's been coming to our church for, I can't remember how long it had been at that point, you know. But it, it had been a few months, you know. And he'd been hearing the gospel when he came to camp and everything. Um, I said, well, we're going to figure that out right now because that's important. And, and so you never know who needs to hear it. Josiah, can you please not keep clicking? Can you please go back? Thank you, buddy. I'm going to lose my place. Keep going back. Thank you. All right, next, next slide, bud. <clears throat> so... Acts 2 says, with many other words, he warned them and he pleaded with them, save yourselves from this corrupt generation. Peter stands up right after Jesus rose again. We call it the day of Pentecost. And he stands up in front of all these Jewish men and he says, you killed Jesus. He says, it's your, you killed the Messiah. You killed the promised one who came. But thank God that was the plan. And he rose again. And so you guys need to do something about this to all of them. Thousands of men. And that's what he says here. He says, with other words, he warns me, please. He says, save yourselves from this corrupt generation. He put it right to him. Talk about not wanting to be offensive. You kill, it's your fault he's dead. You better be glad God brought him back to life because it's on you. So you need to trust in him. And so 3,000 men do right then. All right? Uh, so, so Peter gives them an opportunity to respond. And that's what you need to do. Does that make sense? Do you have any questions about what I've told you? Do you understand what I've told you? Sometimes, if I think I got the time, I'll say, would you mind telling me, based upon what we read, what does it take for a person to go to heaven? Because normally that's the question I say a lot. What does it take for someone to go to heaven? So now that we've gone through all that, according to the Bible, now that we've read it, what do you think it takes for someone to go to heaven? And whatever the response is helps me gauge, okay, did they understand it or not? You know. Just I go on to the next one, bud. So next question, is there anything holding you back from trusting in Jesus right now? That was the question I asked someone this morning, right? My first question was, have you ever placed your faith in Jesus Christ? Because we were in a church setting, so I didn't feel like I had to like, you know, I just want to find out. They clearly know about Jesus because they've been coming to our church. Have you ever placed your faith in Jesus Christ? No, I haven't yet. And so I said, what's holding you back? What is it specifically? Is there something that's holding you back from following Christ? And so then we began our conversation about that. What's holding you back? And so after you've shared the gospel, what's holding you back? And then let them talk. Okay? So that they can share. And they might come back with, well, my parents wouldn't be happy with this, right? Or they might say, um, I'm just not sure. Or they might say, I need more time or whatever. That's fine. Can I get together with you and talk with you more about this? You know? Um, Is there anything, can I show you something else in scripture? You know, is there a question that you have that you're not sure about? And so let them bring up their objections or bring up, is there something holding them back? Okay. Or no, I just don't want to. Okay. What I don't, what we don't need to do is say this. Man, if you leave this, if you leave this church right now, you could walk out in the street, get hit by a car and you'd step out into eternity I mean, you could say that. If God tells you to say that, sure, go ahead and say that. But what I'm not trying to do is I'm not trying to force someone or guilt someone or shame someone into accepting the gospel or scare someone into accepting the gospel. We know the stakes are high. Right? We do. If God so compels you in that moment, like, hey, remind them they're going to hell, (laughs) then do it. But don't do it because you feel like you just want to do it. Or don't do it because you're so desperate for them to come to Christ. Oftentimes, if I come to this question, I say, is there anything holding you back? And say, I'm just not, I don't want to do this today. I'll remind them gently with scripture. Man, listen, I understand it's a big decision. It's your life. You remember we'd said, 
that apart from God, like we are separated from God. That, that's the state we're currently in. The Bible does say, you notice we didn't talk a lot about hell in this particular presentation of the gospel. But people do need to know that hell's real, right? But man, I would hate for you to waver on this point and postpone it. Is there something truly that you're struggling with that I can help you with? And the reason I say that is because I'm not going to pressure anyone into the gospel, but I also want to make sure that they recognize this might be their best chance. And so you have me, I'm a captive audience right now. If you have an objection or something you don't understand, then let's deal with that. You're telling me you're not ready, and that's fine if you're not ready. But I do want to remind you, we don't have all of eternity to make this decision. God only knows how long we have. So don't feel like a rock's going to fall out of the sky and hit you on the head or anything. But at the same time, it doesn't hurt to, to express that it is a choice that needs to be made. Just I go to the next one. Huh? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, people have an idea. So I don't want to get bogged down too much because we really got to finish. But um, just because someone has an idea of who they think God is doesn't mean they worship the true God. We've all been guilty of thinking we know who God is. And so we've been worshiping him in that manner. And then we find out, oh, no, he's not that way. And there's many people who think God's a good God. He's a loving God. He would never send anyone to hell, man. He's just, he's just the best friend ever. And, and I love him so much. But if you don't believe that people are dying and going to hell, then you don't know God. So, yeah, they would say, well, God, you know what? If God does exist, he loves everybody anyway, so I'm fine. Or they say, I know that God's sending me to hell, so I'm just going to enjoy myself here and now. That's, you know? So, so everyone, everyone can decide who they think God is, but that really doesn't matter. You can, say, you can say whatever you want about God. That doesn't really matter. What does the Bible say about God? And the thing is, there have been times in my life where I wish that God didn't say some of the things quite the way he said them in the Bible. But I've got to decide, you know what? <laughs> God said it. I've got to worship that God, not who I think God should be, but God as he says he is. And God says that he loves everyone, but that sinners go to hell. It, regardless of living a wicked life or a wonderful, beautiful, lovely life, Everyone is going to hell unless they accept Jesus Christ as their Savior. End of story. It doesn't matter if you're Mother Teresa or if you're Hitler. If you die in your sins without ever accepting Christ as your Savior, you are going to hell. There's no in-between. That's, that's why this matters. If I thought everyone was going to heaven or even all the good people are going to heaven, then what's even the point of doing this? The point is, it doesn't matter how good you are. If you do not accept Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, you are not going to heaven. You are going to hell. Um, all right. Acts 17 says this, When they heard about the resurrection of the dead, some of them sneered, but others said, We want to hear you again on this subject. At that, Paul left the council. Some of the people became followers of Paul and believed. So we ultimately, we leave it up to people to decide. If they want to hear more, great. And so never, never close the conversation. Never say, if you don't pray right now, I'm never going to talk to you about this again, right? If they say, I have more questions, say, listen, can I answer them? If they say, not right now, I'd like to talk about it later. Great. Let's, we, can, we can talk another time. We'll set it up later. You know me. You've got my phone number. We can talk another time. That's fine. You can come to Mallet Bible Fellowship, get your questions answered, learn more about it. Please do so. You know what I mean? Put, always try, if you can, to carry something with you or show them the app, but give them a track and say, here, there's more information. You can find out more. Uh, continuing the conversation, we're going to just briefly skip through this. Go ahead, Josiah. So this is an app you can download. You can just Google it. It's uh, just called Life in Six Words. This goes through. It's an interactive app with everything that we just talked about. So it's a great little handy visual tool. So it's a track in your pocket all the time. Put it on your phone. You can always have it. You can always share it at any time. 
and that goes through the gospel. We're going to click through the next few screens, Josiah, because this is just more about the app that we're not going to look at right now. <clears throat> Keep going. Keep going. Sharing the gospel is a lot like piloting an airplane. You have to prepare, oh, the whole follow thing. a flight plan, and land safely. And that's exactly what you should that's do fine. when you talk to someone about Jesus. No, that's fine. I won't skip. Uh, ignore that. So anyways, this just runs the entire video from start to finish. Um, okay, so uh, we'll meet again next week. It'll be our last week as far as I know. Um, but I, I encourage you this week, download that app. Life in Six Words. I'll run up in a second, see if I have any of those booklets left upstairs, and give you some other tracks as well that you can take with you. I encourage you this week, just start. Just ask somebody. Just do it. Like, William, proud of you, man. Like, just ask, you know. Your brother, just start the conversation going. Just open it up. You never know who needs to hear it. It could be someone sitting in this church every week. You never know. So don't beat around the bush, you know. Hey, have you ever trusted in Christ as your Savior? Hey, what do you believe it takes for someone to go to heaven? Do you believe there's a God? Just start the conversation. If it's someone you've never met before, then sure. Start with, how's it going? How's the weather? Don't dive straight into, there's this famous joke, right? Is, um, someone says, oh man, it's really hot in here. You go, you think that's hot? The fires of hell are burning eternally for the souls of sinners who have not repented. You know, like, don't do that. But take your time, uh, share, and, and be genuinely interested in someone's life. Right? Yeah. <laughs> what was the rest of that? Uh, yeah. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> I was like, whoo, burned myself. You know where? I'll never be burning in hell, though. I'll tell you that. Um, so, yeah. Uh, and the great thing is, there's plenty of other things I can share with you about ways that you can bring up the gospel. Um, but especially, like, like William was talking about, going door to door. Like, we're not, we're not playing around, you know? Like, clearly I'm here at your door for a reason. I didn't just come over to say hello. So you, that, that gives you an opportunity to just start in. Hi, my name is William. I'm from Mallet Bible Fellowship. I just wonder if I could ask you a question. If you were to die today, are you sure you'd go to heaven? You know, or in your understanding, what does it take to go to heaven? And would you like to know what the Bible says about how you can know for sure that you're going to heaven? Something as simple as that. It does not have to be complex. You don't even have to. Don't, don't psych yourself out. Just start. Uh, do you go to church anywhere? To me, that's a great middle of the road. Do you go to church anywhere is a great middle of the road because I want to talk to you about something spiritual. But before we get to my beliefs, do you go to church anywhere? How long have you been going? Start asking questions. That's a, that's a great starter. To me, that's almost the beginning starter question. You don't have to like talk about the weather for 12 minutes first. You know, I was just wondering. I've never asked you. You know, it might be your neighbor. I've never asked you before. But uh, do you go to church anywhere? And just let it go. See what happens. And then you'll find out a lot about somebody. And just keep asking questions. All right? Let's pray. Father, I love you. Thank you for our time together, Lord. I thank you for these men who are committed to coming and doing more training on sharing the gospel. Pray that you'd bless our time uh, this evening and give us boldness to share the gospel this week. In Jesus' name, amen.